Hello, Chiefs Kingdom, and welcome to the Arrowhead Kingdom Chiefs cast, live from the Wolf Den. I am Chris. And I'm Josh, and today we're going to be talking about Week 8, all the other stuff that's going on in the NFL, and uh, things like that. We'll preview Week 9, too. Big reminder that all Chiefs fans are invited to join us for game day. Visit arrowheadkingdom.org to learn more about the group and to find your local chapter. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Yep, It would be just me and Josh giving... But what's up on the Kansas City Chiefs today? And we're, of course, presented by Complete Weddings and Events, your leading provider of photo, video, DJ, photo booth, lighting, and coordination services. Visit them at completewedo.com. All right. So do you want to talk Chiefs or all the other non-Chiefs stuff going on first? <laughs> let's let's get the Chiefs done okay. first, and then we can yeah, tackle the uh... – a week that was drama, total drama. Yeah, got it. Okay, so it looks like we're eight games, what would typically be halfway through a season, except now we're not quite halfway through a season. And when we record next week, we're going to be just over halfway through the season. So I guess, first of all, what are your thoughts on the season? You know, sitting here at four mm-hmm. and four, that puts us definitely not leading the division, which is a weird feeling. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been a disappointment. You know, there was really high expectations and the feeling that this team had addressed, you know, its weaknesses and, you know, seemed to have a, a more well-rounded roster. But unfortunately, you know, it, it, it just hasn't worked out so far. Um, doesn't mean that it still can't, but there's definitely some things that um, – you know, the team, especially the offense and Patrick Mahomes have to adjust to and have to, you know, like I mentioned, I think last week, they need to evolve into, you know, rather than just going out there and thinking that they can do whatever they want, they need to figure out how they can actually um, counter punch against the defenses that they're facing. Um, You know, uh, the defense, you know, while I didn't think that they were going to be great coming into the season it was really frustrating to see the you know I guess it would be the the first six or seven games that they had um, outside of the Redskins or sorry the the football team um, and the Giants slip, game. Huh? <laughs> yeah and the Giants I mean they've they've gotten lit up pretty good so I'm hoping that maybe you know even even the second half of the Titans game, maybe they've, they've found something more and, and are actually Spags is actually able to start highlighting their strengths more and not leaning too much on guys that have turned out to be um, liabilities. Like the one over my left shoulder. <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, I don't yeah. like calling him that, but it's, it's, you know, this, you know, the numbers don't lie right now, unfortunately. No, I mean, there's, there's no joy in that, but just, the one really big play the Giants had last week was the the one time they really got to target him in coverage. <laughs> yeah, there's the a John Ross. Yeah, there's a <clears throat> there's a meme floating around um, on uh, like a NFL memes or whatever, and it just says uh, the biggest thing that Andy Reid needs to do to get Patrick Mahomes right is get him put in a position to play a game against uh, Dan Sorensen in coverage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there you go. That, that right there, um, you know, that that comment there to me kind of sums up where the season's yeah. been. But I uh, still don't believe that this uh, season's over with. And it looks like we have an opportunity to, you know, win this coming week. The uh, Giants game this last week wanted to see more out of the offense. And it looked like we were going to during that first drive, but it ended how all too many of the drives have ended. And it, it, it seems like in a lot of ways um, the team's kind of letting stuff like that get to them a little too much. And uh, it was, it was really, that play was just dumb to watch, you know, throw the ball into the end zone and uh, McKissa or uh, Jarek McKinnon. Yeah. um, His helmet did it. Yeah. I mean, it looked like he was playing volleyball, you know, it looked like he was playing volleyball and it reminded me of uh, being in high school and, doing defensive back practice and it's like all right we're gonna tap the ball around you know you don't get to catch it you got to tap it so your uh, teammate can possibly make a play on it something to that effect I mean that's what that looked like 
Yeah. And it just had a, uh, you know, of course that's how this one's going to go. You know, why, what, what else could possibly, you know, go wrong? Let's figure it out. And that's, that's how the end of that drive seemed to me. But that all said, um, we, we've taken every single possible lump that we can. We've, we've seen more just defensive prowess, if you will, from our opponents than, than we should. And we're four and four. And we, we still have, you know, winning the division well within our control, even, you know, I mean, we have, we have five divisional games still. So I think there's reason to be optimistic, but it starts with, uh, let's talk about this weekend coming up, but it starts with, we've got to take care of business against the Packers. And we were dealt a uh, piece of fortune, if you want to call it that. I don't know what else to, to call it other than an opportunity for us in that we don't have to play against Aaron Rodgers, which means that is this the uh, the second or third time that the Chiefs and Packers have played each other in – this would be only the second, right? Well, let's see. They played uh, – so they played back in 2013 or 2014. No, let me backtrack that. Sorry. It would have been 2015 when we went up there with Alex Smith. Yep. And so got 15 and then 19. And then 19 was the Matt Moore game. Um, and then 2011, oh, yeah, that's when we upset them when they were 13-0. Uh, and 0. Correct. That was the Kyle yeah, Horton game. <laughs> it was. I was watching that with a Packer fan in a Chicago bar, and I couldn't even I couldn't even harass him. I was just kind of like, I'm sorry, man. We're not going anywhere. And Yeah, this is stupid. <laughs> we're, we're breaking up your history. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going anywhere except to yeah. ruin your season. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, you're right. 15 was the year that um, they came up here. And, and so we're a couple years away from the chiefs coming back up here again. So mm -hmm. 2019 is the one I was thinking of. So um, sure. that was supposed to be the Mahomes Rogers game yep. and we didn't get it. And this was supposed to be the next crack at the Mahomes Rogers game and we're not going to get it. So one of these years um, the, the chiefs and Packers are going to play each other and Mahomes and Rogers are going to play against each other, but apparently it's not going to happen this year, which is unfortunate. So um, this whole Rogers thing has just been kind of unintentional comedy as best. And it's been uh, really interesting to just watch how he is. And if you look at the stuff that he's, you know, put in print today and, and said with, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. with um, the uh, Pat, Pat McAfee. McAfee. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like, you, you kind of understand where he's coming from, I, I guess. But at the same time, it's just like, dude, you, <laughs> you knew you knew that if you had a positive test, this is what was going to happen. And I, I just I, I don't know. It, this doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that's the irony about, you know, him not being available for this matchup is as preventable, um, you know, whereas, you know, two years ago, it was not so much for for Pat, but. Yeah, the thing that gets me with Rodgers is just the way he draws attention to himself off the field with, you know, being on the Pat Mac McAfee show. Um, he just, you know, makes these um, kind of um, sketchy, well, not sketchy, but, you know, just these um, subliminal type of comments that I, I just, I don't know exactly how his teammates view him and how he's in the locker room. But, you know, from my viewpoint, him being more of a distraction than he already was with the positive test doesn't bode well for them on Sunday. I mean, yeah, I, I didn't hear Matt LaFleur's press conference today, but I, I heard some comments on it from an interview with a, a reporter from WTMJ. And Matt LaFleur was like pretty irritated that he was having to answer questions mm -hmm. literally a half hour after he got done talking on the Matt. Uh, Pat McAfee show yeah well exactly and, and the whole thing is just uh you watch the video of him at the beginning he's like well I'm immunized and everything like that and just yeah. has this kind of weird vibe to him it, it's like did you eat a bunch of stuff you weren't supposed to before you came in here to talk to these guys yeah. he just seemed kind of uh kind of spacey you know and then 
And then today it's like, well, if they would have asked a follow-up question when I said I was immunized, I would have told them that I'm not an anti-vaxxer, but I didn't take this vaccine because of X, Y, Z. And it's like, what? Yeah, he was allergic to, I guess, some of the yeah. components he said, but yeah. Well, that, and that's it. I mean, if he's allergic to the components and mm-hmm. Moderna and Pfizer, I understand mm-hmm. that. And uh, I definitely understand anybody who says I don't want to do Johnson and Johnson. Um, mm-hmm. That that makes sense to me. It really does. Um, and uh you know, just this whole thing would have been different if he would have gone the route of like Cole Beasley at the beginning saying, I'm not doing this, you know, yeah. and just be that way at the beginning. And there, there wouldn't be this whole circus that Matt LaFleur is having to answer questions after he was on the Pat McAfee show, you know, half an hour ago. And that's the part that I think is ridiculous. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I think that uh, you and I have both made our kind of stance pretty clear. I've got the vaccine the first time that they would let me get mm-hmm. it because I just want life to get back to normal. And, uh, you know, I, I think that the easiest way to let life get back to normal, regardless of what you're talking about, is take a vaccine that's been, you know, made for preventable diseases. And that's how I personally view COVID. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, but I, I, I understand people that don't want to get the vaccine. And there's a, there's a certain length down the path of the, the conspiracy that I can understand. Um, and I definitely don't fault people that make a personal choice that they don't want to get this because this is essentially the flu shot, not preventing, you know, <laughs> polio. <laughs> that I don't yeah. understand. Any, anybody who doesn't yeah. take the polio vaccine or give it to their kids, I don't understand that. I'll just throw that out yeah. there. <laughs> I think the thing that really gets in my craw about this situation is that, you know, Rogers wasn't following protocols. I mean, he was essentially, you know, not you know, not living the life of a, of a non-vaxxer when he should have been and, you know, putting, you know, a room of reporters at risk because he's not, mm-hmm. you know, wearing a mask like he should be. Mm-hmm. So that that's what really annoys me about that is it's just, okay, if you're going to make that choice, then that means that there are things that you have to do then. And, you know, and I, I know people that, you know, have made that choice, but they also follow like, you know, guidelines to, you know, by the fact that they're not vaccinated. So the whole fact that he's not been vaccinated, now the, the team's under investigation from all this because they violated uh, NFL protocols. That's That to me is really arrogant, in my opinion. Yeah, and I mean, it's just, is this really what anybody has time to be dealing with? Um, no. You know, I, I, I understand um, potential pushback against saying, you know, hey, the government that we may or may not have, you know, personally elected can't sit here and make all these uh, choices to control our lives and stuff like that. Um, I, I understand that. What I don't understand is trying to blow back that way against the business. You don't have to be part of this. Um, the NFL mm-hmm. is well within its rights to make whatever rules that they want, regardless of how rational they are or not. And the mm-hmm. NFL rule was pretty clear from the beginning. It's, you know, you, you're either going to get the vaccine because we believe in it or you're going to follow a certain set of protocol and you know one is to do all the stuff the cds but cdc has been saying uh, (laughs) when it comes to prevention if you're if you're not going to be vaccinated and the other thing that was crystal clear is if you have a positive test you are uh not going to be playing any football for 10 days pretty pretty plain and simple so it is yeah just because you think a rule is silly doesn't mean that you can't, you don't have to follow it. I mean, it, the rule's the rule. I mean, the equally yeah. silly thing is that he um, tried to appeal and they told him no. <laughs> it's just, I didn't know. I, didn't and, 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 I mean, I, uh, one, of the, one of the things I got, I, I got the impression that he, I, I, what, I, what I couldn't tell is where in the timeline this happened. If this was his reaction to his current situation or if he tried it earlier it's probably more of a reaction to his current situation but you know he 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 went out and sought like independent medical consult and stuff like that and uh that in and of itself isn't a bad thing that's a good thing but you know you gotta you gotta be on the up and up of where you are and there shouldn't be as many surprised people that he's having to sit out for 10 days nope so yeah so anyway um back to the actual football game how do you think the sunday is going to go now i still think it's going to be a tough game um i think i think the packers are in a lot better position than they were uh really pre matt lafleur i think matt lafleur has really built a nice system 
mm-hmm. um, and, a, and a nice roster that they can get by, I think, without Aaron for, you know, one or two games. Um, and they're catching the Chiefs at the right time as well. I mean, they're, they're actually – uh, a good defensive team, which doesn't really get talked much about them. Mm-hmm. You know, even though they lost Zadarius Zer- Smith for the year, they still have some guys over there and they just picked up Whitney, Whitney Merciless. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you still got Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon, who um, I think are an excellent uh, one, two tandem in the backfield. You got Devonte Adams back. Um, they still have, um, from what I understand, still a very good offensive line. So, there's a good infrastructure there for Jordan Love to be successful. Um, it just comes down to, uh, you know, what is he capable of doing? Um, is he going to just come in and they're going to, you know, basically try and, and keep him from losing the game? Or is there actually something that Jordan Love can contribute that Aaron Rodgers can't maybe in the way of athleticism at this point? And that's the one thing I think we're, we're probably going to see a little bit more of is probably Jordan Love on the move in this game and, and how, how does, how does the Chiefs defense deal with that? Yeah, I expect the exact same thing. Um, <clears throat> the biggest thing that makes me recognize that this is going to be a tough game is uh, their running game and their defense, which you brought up. I mean, that they, they're, they're going to be able to come in and play the same defense that every team that's had success beating us is, is doing. Mm-hmm. And they've got the uh, player personnel to make those moves and um, they are going to come in and they're going to run the ball. So uh, we definitely do have a, a task ahead of us, but um, you know, maybe this is the week that we truly get a running game going at home. And maybe this is the week that Pat takes the uh, Patrick, sorry, I don't want to get smacked by mom Holmes. Uh, <laughs> that Patrick, uh, <laughs> the Patrick, um, you know, truly, just operates in that taking the the short passes that the defense gives them and gets to a point where he can play auction, take the top off the, the defense a time or two and uh, hit Tyreek, uh, you know, deep. So um, that's what I'm looking forward to. Um, at this point, I think the Chiefs have to, to come out of this with a win. Um, they didn't necessarily, you know, have to when Rodgers is going to be under center, but I think with a backup under center, they they have to. This is a must win game. Um, I don't think that we're quite into every week's a playoff at this point. We're getting close to that point, but this is a must win game. Yeah, it's an opportunity you can't blow. And that for me, it's, you know, if, if they don't win this game, at least my mindset's going to be more. And I hate using the term lost season. And, you know, you're going to have those, you know, with the franchise quarterback. Hell, the Packers have had them with Aaron Rodgers. Mm-hmm. So you know, at least my mindset's going to be more toward thinking about, okay, what's this roster going to look like in the next couple of years? And my hope is that um, Brett Veach starts to plan for that as opposed to, you know, as we talked about, not trying to hold this together um, too much longer, but yeah. Um, that, yeah. This, they have a really, you know, this and, you know, we'll talk about this in a little bit next week as well, a situation there that they may be able to take advantage of as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, uh, <clears throat> wrote my article for arrowhead one this week and um i i started everything with uh yeah, talking about that out. yeah yeah talking about the movie that thing you do and yeah i gave, gave you a shout out because yeah, you appreciate it. did everything perfectly with that boiling point but um i've kind of started getting the impression that that the boiling point as you were talking about with with you know hitchens and honey badger i don't care what hitchens has to say i do care what honey badger has to say what tyra matthew is a leader of the defense and the whole thing you, you could say calling us a toxic fan base is just downright slander, but at the same time, um, you know, it's an emotional guy that wears it on a sleeve and he threw out explosive terminology because he was mad and he, he was, he was mad because probably more than anything that the team's losing. I mean, that's mm-hmm. really probably what makes him most mad. So uh, yeah, I, I kind of agree with you that there's probably not an extension coming for him anymore. I think that this is his last season with us and, that uh was probably another part of the frustration with everything and that um you know we're kind of getting to a point where we need to reassess what the core is because you know last season we decided that the entire starting 22 was the core and we brought back 21 of them Mm -hmm. and uh this year we decided that the core was everybody that we could keep with the exception of sammy Watkins, and you know i think that some more difficult decisions are going to have to to get made and um 
we're going to need to hit on more uh, draft picks than just uh, Bolton and Gay, but those mm-hmm. are looking like fairly decent picks at this point. Um, if Legarius Sneed could go ahead and get back to the uh, form that he was in last year as a rookie, that would uh, be helpful as well. And, Ooh. um, you know, Beach is definitely going to have to um, hit some uh, good draft picks here in the next coming years. And hopefully they're still at the uh, bottom part of the, uh, the draft or- order. I hope so too. Yeah. I mean, and that, that, that has to come, you know, with more of a paradigm shift where Brett Beach has got to look to gain and, and draft capital, not use draft capital to try and, and bring in NFL ready players. I mean, he was, he did it with the Melvin Ingram this past week. So there, there's yeah. a six rounder that we won't have. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he's, he's made his stance clear. His chips are still in the middle. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm, I understand it, but yeah, he's got to, if, I mean, regardless of the result this year, I think he's got to, he's got to double back on his uh, roster construction. And yeah, I mean, with, with Tyron Matthew, you know, I, I said in the article, you know, we, we really got burned by Eric Berry, unfortunately, because, Mm -hmm. and that was no fault of his. It was, you know, basically a career ending Achilles injury for him. Yeah. And it's, it's risky. I mean, you might be putting Jamal Adams money into Tyron Matthew going into his thirties. And, you know, we've, again, we've, we've had some, some bad contracts mm-hmm. by paying guys more of what they've done in the past and not what they, what they're going to do. And that's really what um, I hope that Brett Feach starts to do and starts to show constraint is that he's making those tough decisions. Yeah. And I would say that, uh, Mathau not being on an extension right now is the first step in making those tough decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I really think that. And uh, yeah, I mean, you can't have too many highest paid player at their position on a, on one roster. I mean, no. this is still just a math problem and you know, that's, that's where that is. So. Yep. All right. Well, let's uh, let's kind of stay in the AFC West here for a little bit. I know you mentioned that we might have another, um, team with a little bit of turmoil coming up and and what you're talking about is the game against the Raiders, um, which is week 10. What the hell Henry Ruggs? I, I, I mean, I was a, I was appalled reading that. I mean, the headline itself and, and just knowing that he got a DUI and, and somebody ended up dying in the car wreck was, was bad. But then you sit there and read the thing that he was going 156 miles an hour. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know a single city in the country where that's even a a thought that should enter your head in a residential neighborhood and i mean you've been to vegas right i've only flown through vegas okay so i've not been around vegas i cannot i can't think of a single place that i don't don't even know how you get going that fast in a residential neighborhood I i really don't i mean that car just had to have been as not street legal as you could possibly be i mean i it's just insane and you just completely feel for the lady who was just trying to go home after a really late shift from from what it sounds like that had her freaking dog with her 3 30 in the morning i think yeah yeah exactly it's like she's just trying to go home and it's just like this crazy scenario that you play out in your head when you're when you've got like dumb dark thoughts in and it's just like oh what if some car would just come flying through here and you know crash into me and you know i'm engulfed in flames and that's essentially what happened i mean god that that dude's life is just over over mm-hmm. over something but I, I don't know that i could put together a, a more irrational train of thoughts than than what he was doing i mean to just be going that fast on on top of driving around with a loaded gun and then uh being twice the legal limit drunk it's just it, it's insane it, this is mind-boggling yeah i I don't think he's going to play another down of football in the NFL. That's, that's no, there's I'm absolutely saying. no way. I don't, I don't think he's going to be walking around can. free anytime in the next two decades. Yeah. I mean, every, everything that just comments from the judge saying that I've never seen a speed that high my entire time on the bench. It's like, the, yeah. to me, that's him saying uh prosecutor asked for the uh, max and uh, you're not going to see any arguments from me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's tragic for that woman. I mean, yeah, 
I, I haven't read a lot of detail on it, mainly because it is appalling. And I, I just know it would, yeah, I mean, it would make me feel really terrible for her and really pissed at Henry Ruggs. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah, terrible situation. Uh, the other thing that I will throw out there, Carr has come out and said that, you know, he's supporting Henry Ruggs as a friend. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. Um, you don't have to agree with every decision that people you care about make to to say that you still care about them as a person. So, no, well, I mean the, those guys are probably like family in that locker room. I'm sure they are. So, yeah, you know. And uh, all uh, all Derek Carr said was, uh, you know, everybody hates him right now, and he's like, I'm gonna love him because he's my family, you know. And I I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So. So yeah, interesting couple of uh, weeks of football we have coming up with uh teams that might be um you know fairly distracted so I, I would definitely implore the chiefs to take advantage of that um anything else in the afc west you want to talk about no i can't think of anything in the afc west all right well now that we're talking about the rest of the afc we might as well mm -hmm. uh stop by the uh afc north and uh what's going yeah. on in cleveland <laughs> Uh, that that was a move that was probably one year too late um i agree i i just i mean i've never been a, an odell beckham jr fan i think that he is about himself and while he may you know be ultra competitive he just you know the the way that he shows emotion is not healthy and it's you know, it's, it's no doubt in my mind affected the Giants, and I think that it does affect the Browns in some way. And one of my um, favorite takes is um, Soren Petro says, you know, it, it, one of the things about having Odell Beckham in your huddle with Baker Mayfield is that Baker Mayfield is likely not the alpha dog in that huddle. Sure. And if your quarterback's not the alpha dog, that's, that's a big issue. So um, whether that was going on or not, um, I, I think I think that was addition by subtraction for the Browns. By the way, um, the way that Odell Beckham Jr. expresses himself, I think, was uh, shown pretty clearly where he gets that from and how far the uh, apple <laughs> doesn't fall from the tree. Did you yeah. watch that video his dad put together? No. Okay, so maybe I'm just dumb, but it's on it's on Instagram, so you have to go to his Instagram page. And sure. He cut and paste this whole thing together. And the video is uh, running like it would be in landscape mode, but it, it's like sideways the entire time. So you have to kind of turn your head sideways. Maybe I'm dumb and not finding the right one, but I just, I thought that was hilarious looking at that. And uh, I was listening to um, First Things First with Nick Wright. And Nick Wright was just like, yeah, you know, the one takeaway that I have to throw out as I'm watching that going like, holy crap, Odell Beckham's getting open a lot. He's really good at football still. And <laughs> he could really help a team out, which was definitely true. Um, there, yeah. there definitely were a lot of plays that he was open. And, um, you know, those guys went on to talk about how um, the uh, play in particular against the Vikings, you know, that would have been a first down that could have iced the game. It, it was one of the plays that made that. So there's some of that there, but I mean, good lord i i uh i definitely think that getting into a fight with your dad is the worst possible thing that you can do no matter what age you are but yeah. that would be uh that would be one of the one of the things that i think would justify it if you yep. go and do something like that but i mean it's hard to it's hard to picture odell beckham jr not having an idea that something like that's coming out but it's just what a what an unceremonious way to just uh put a stop to something and um you know I, I just think it's uh ridiculous the whole thing but at the same time i mean nfl teams have so much control over players and uh that really might have been the only way that he could get out of there in the middle of the season i mean you, you watch the ben simmons situation with the 76ers and uh sure. it's like uh do we really expect these guys to take the high road when they could get cut yeah. for no reason tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, or James Harden last year with the Rockets. That was exactly an interesting situation. But yeah. it, it, exactly. You know, and it, it, it's just, you know, may, maybe, uh, maybe there, there was a little bit of, of that to it, but it still doesn't justify going out and like burning somebody who's supposed to be, you know, a good friend and the leader of your football team. I mm -hmm. think that's messed up, but um, 
you know, Baker Mayfield seems like he was caught a little off guard by it and uh, seems yeah. to be handling things about as well as he possibly could. So, you know, this will be uh, interesting, but let's ask the real question. So he, he goes through, he clears waivers. I don't see any way that he doesn't clear waivers at this point. So he's a free agent. <clears throat> does Veach pick up the phone and talk to his agent? I'm sure he does. Do I want him on the chiefs? No. Um, I mean, does he have a lot of football in him? Probably, but I just, I, I just don't think that guy is good for, for an NFL locker room. I really don't, unless he proves me otherwise. Here's the only thing that I'll say. I think the second half of this season is the uh, <clears throat> time that he undoubtedly has to dial that crap back. Well, he does, but the Chiefs don't have the money to pay him. You're, you're probably going to get him on yeah. his best behavior, you know, at this point. And, uh, you know, I just picture him across from Tyree Kill, and if he stays on the uh, field twice as much as Sammy Watkins did and plays that role better, which is what I think that we would be getting, I think it would be kind of crazy to not consider it. Yeah, I just – I think financially it's not feasible either. I mean – I I haven't checked the cap number lately, but I mean, I think he's probably going to go more for than just, you know, what, one and a half million dollars, give or take. So. So how uh, I'm pulling up the over the cap number right now. So yeah. the way I understand everything is that if he's picked up on waivers, he's owed something like seven and a half million through the end of the season. <clears throat> but if um, he. Yeah, I'm not too, I'm not too up to date on on how that works but i th- i think yeah, yeah you're right no i think you're right yeah if he if he pick, gets uh prorated but if he clears waivers and yeah that that essentially he's cut free from that salary yeah and so uh, as of right now the chiefs according to over the cap.com have 3.3 million in space left so hmm. you know in in theory we could potentially get him for that so I just, I can't, I can't stand his sideline demeanor and I don't know. I I just can't get over that. I think there is, there's a limit to, um, you know, talent and, and just personality. And I think his personality for me, at least it, it, it just drowns out the talent. Yep. The only thing I'd say, I, I really think we're going to get the most muted version of his personality the second half of yeah. the 2021 season. So Good. don't resign him. <laughs> but anyway. Um, all right. So uh, anything else AFC we need to address aside from the Bills seem to be a good team? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, we talked a little bit about uh, Derrick Henry being out for at least the regular season. So, yep. I mean, they're, they're game against the Rams will give us an idea of just how how crucial Derrick Henry is to that offense yeah which I think is going to be very crucial I agree um so it's again it's a wide open AFC where I think the Bills are going to come out of the other side and then the other six seeds are going to be I have no idea yeah yeah I mean how much do you trust Cincinnati to win the north at this point <laughs> I don't know after they got bit by uh Mike White the, uh, yeah. the urban legend there but yeah yeah no, at this point, I wouldn't be shocked to see the Steelers just, you know, win that division with they a could. ten and seven record. <laughs> so, yeah, they definitely yeah. could. Yeah. So, uh, flipping over to the NFC a little bit, um, the Rams got more interesting. And if you want to talk about a team that uses their draft picks as uh, trade ships, there you go. <laughs> I mean, man, Von Miller. <laughs> The uh, main thing that I say is uh, good riddance from the uh, AFC West. We're glad you're not there anymore. Um, Mm -hmm. Even if you are starting to uh, age, I definitely do not mind seeing him go to the uh, NFC. (laughs) Nope, I don't either. Um, Yeah, I I, I don't. The Rams are clearly an all-in team, which Mm -hmm. happened the last three years. But yeah, uh, they've. And, and, and they've lived up to it so far, too. It's not as if they're they're underachieving. Yep, for sure. Yeah, so that's going to be interesting. Um, can't wait till the next time they play the Cardinals to see where those mm-hmm. teams are. Um, you know, but it still seems like uh, Rams, Cardinals, Bucks, and uh, uh, Packers would be who mm-hmm. I would 
throw out as the uh, yeah. Cowboys the teams, and then of course the Cowboys. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yep. Yep. The, the NFC, NFC is very top heavy right now. Um, yep. Got it. Got it. Uh, let's... Brief roster a little bit more. All righty. So, um, anything else on the NFC? Any uh, any games coming up this weekend that you're really looking forward to? Let me see real quick. Um, you know, it was interesting. Is there? I think it was might have been a Sunday night. They threw out the fact that this upcoming weekend it has the the most, I guess, Super Bowl rematches of any uh, NFL weekend in, in league history. So it's really it's like the Cowboys and the Broncos, the Patriots, the Panthers, Chiefs, Packers, Jets, um, Colts, and then there was at least one more. But yeah, that was oh uh, Rams Titans. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll but, be an interesting yeah. one. Yeah, well, good stuff. Um, no, definitely, definitely gonna be looking at that. And uh, yeah, your uh, your pick of the Colts to to cover that <laughs> spread was definitely good. Um, you know, if the if the Jets could have thrown together a couple of defensive series, um, you know, I think well, they, uh, they almost backed it at the end. They were. Well, exactly go there with a minute left to go <laughs> yeah exactly exactly uh yeah. all right so um the week was a song where are you going uh this is more an ode to uh i think the text going around during the giants game between the the milwaukee group but i'm gonna go with uh one bourbon one scotch and one beer yeah uh, the john lee hooker version uh oh, there you go yeah so uh, definitely that that game I will say that I was definitely um feeling a lot of stress anxiety and anger and yeah it was it was one of those games where you definitely needed something stronger than beer to to try and calm the nerves yeah sure the uh the rally shots definitely happened I yeah. I made it out to the wolf den we actually had a few new people which was really Good. cool yeah so that was uh that was nice. Um, it looks like we got a, a handful of young couples moving to town, which is interesting. Right. It's kind of what we've seen. So, uh, yeah, the uh, Milwaukee Chiefs family is still going. Um, no, so I, uh, I I picked the Shania Twain song, You're Still the One, because um, that's uh, that's kind of how I was. And, you know, you get to that last uh, that last series and it's just like, man, if we don't if we mess this up and turn the ball over, we're not going to win this game, you know. Yeah. And uh, I don't really want to be going into overtime to let a coin flip give Daniel Jones a chance to possibly like break a run or something stupid like that. But, uh, yeah. you know, first line of that song looks like we made it, you know, <laughs> and that's how I felt. And, uh, you know, still still all in on this team, still think they can do great things. And, you know, I'm not uh, I'm not going to say that the Chiefs are a Super Bowl contender, but what I will say is that I still believe they're going to make the playoffs and nobody wants to uh, host us any week oh, if they make the playoffs the over, schedule yeah. that they have i mean yeah they they will have hit hit some type of stride and some momentum going into playoffs exactly exactly so yeah i mean who knows what's gonna happen you know it could be a could be a surprising season so mm -hmm. uh let's talk uh fantasy here real quick um anything uh particular that jumped out at you from a fantasy standpoint I'm, I'm just having a terrible fantasy uh, stretch right now where, yeah, I, you know, I lost Derrick Henry in one of my leagues this, this past, or yeah, I've lost him. Uh, my auction league, I'm not getting as much out of uh, my strategic drafting of, um, um, oh my gosh, uh, Murray and, and Hopkins over in Arizona. So yeah. that was, that was a strategy I think is backfiring on me right now. Um, so yeah, I don't really have anything of, of note as far as my teams went. Yeah. Now the uh, <clears throat> one that jumped out at me more than anything is uh, apparently I missed what I really do think is going to be the one week that it was great to have Michael Carter from the jets on, on your mm -hmm. team. I uh, definitely didn't play him, but yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, he put up 28 points and uh yahoo ppr league and i uh conveniently had emmanuel sanders in there um scoring zero apparently he couldn't haul in a single one of his uh touches um uh, 
one player wasn't making the difference for me because I uh, got nothing out of Kyle Pitts as well. But, um, you know, Michael Carter was my uh, fantasy player of the week. He was the top scorer in our ESPN league right ahead of uh, AJ Brown. So, um, you know, here we are. But uh, I've, I've got high hopes for us coming up this uh, week. <laughs> Who are we playing this upcoming week? So we're playing uh, Tucker Franklin. All right. Yeah. And uh, we already have our uh, 34 from our running back, Jonathan Taylor. Oh, nice. Yeah. I wonder so, how Tucker's doing with his new gig. I haven't. Yeah. Should I done him a bit. Yeah. check in with that dude? But yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, any uh, old friend alerts, uh, former, former chiefs that caught your eye? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um... You know what? Not that nothing that comes top of mind right now. All right. But as we get into final takes, I know that you do have some old friends from another Kansas City team. So I'll let you I do. go ahead and go. Yeah. Um, so the Atlanta Braves kind of had a, a Kansas City Royals 2014 like run and actually sealed the deal by winning the World Series this year. And um, what's notable about the roster is, you know, first of all, Jorge Soler getting traded um, to the Braves where, you know, he was having a horrendous year as a Royal. And then the week before he got dealt, he started to catch fire. And then once he became a Brave, he turned back into, um, I think, the, the 2019 version of Jorge Soler, which uh, got a lot of fans bent out of shape, which with all due respect, I mean, Jorge Soler wasn't going to resurrect the Royals back into a contender and plus he would you know he couldn't hit his way out of a phone booth um, in 2021 so you know I'm happy for him that he was you know part of the Braves and, and was integral in winning the World Series MVP so that's great for him and then a couple of other Royals one that uh, someone may not remember is Will Smith um, I don't know if he's closing for the Braves, but he's probably he in the back end of their bullpen. He, he is. And yeah, he, he was, uh, I think he made his debut, major league debut with the Royals and pitched in 2012 and 2013 with them. Mm -hmm. And then the other notable guy is Mr. October himself. And I'm talking about Terrence Gore. <laughs> so it was funny because I just randomly happened to turn on one of the Braves postseason games and, you know, I hear the announcers saying, and Terrence Gore is coming in the pinch run. I'm like, holy crap. And they, they went on and on about how Terrence Gore is just like, you know, how he just basically gets signed up by some team about to make the postseason. And then he's just like automatic every time he, uh, you know, basically tries to steal a base. And I think the only time I ever saw him get caught is when he overslid third base against the Astros, which was a bit of a debatable call. But uh mm -hmm. But I'm happy for all three of those guys, especially Jorge Soler. I mean, if you're bitter because the Royals traded him, he went and caught fire and helped someone else win a World Series. I mean, I, I, I don't know. You, you probably need to get your head checked as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, the Royals were not going to go to a World Series with Jorge Soler. If he stayed on with the team, they'd be paying him arbitration. And then it'd probably be another year where he's, you know, barely getting by with a 600 OBP um, in a Royals uniform. So, you know, at least they... They got something back for Jorge Soler, and Jorge Soler was able to come through and, and be a part of the World Series. Yeah, no, I definitely thought it was interesting watching him, and I completely agree with you. I, I, I don't see him putting up any better regular season numbers with the Braves next year. So, no. you know, he's, he's probably going to be on another team by the end of next season. He is so. about as hot and cold of a hitter as you'll find in baseball. He just exactly. happened to be in that hot period yeah, the last yeah. few months pretty good time to catch it yes <laughs> yeah so my my final take is actually baseball as well um definitely uh won't say that i'm a fan of the guy that i'm going to talk about mainly for the team that he played uh played for but um definitely always admired as, as a ball player so a uh, happy retirement to buster posey um you know it's definitely been a a something of a joy watching him play it's uh it's been good mm -hmm. watching him play and uh Dude's going to the Hall of Fame, and it should be on the first ballot. So, yeah, very underrated player. Oh, incredibly, incredibly, yeah. incredibly, and uh, way more likable than Yadier Molina. So, <laughs> <laughs> second that. 
yeah so uh, all right um well that's all i got so i got as well all right well good night chiefs kingdom chiefs <laughs>